Okay, so uh, let me just jump right back just for the sake of recording. So um, again, we're gonna be looking at this 2003-05-21 data set. I clicked on this link to get me to the folder that contains the logs. I clicked on this logs to bring me to our log sheet. Uh, and we've talked about the file name, the source name, the coordinates, the UT time, the hour angle. This next number is the position angle. This just has to do with how these, the image is kind of oriented in, on the sky. You don't have to worry about this too much. Eduardo, did you have a question? No, sorry. Oh, okay, no worries, no worries. Um, this next me uh, measure is the air mass. And this is one of the astronomical jargon terms. This is a measure of essentially uh, what angle uh, relative to straight up is the star? And we call it air mass because if you look at a star that's dipped down toward the horizon, we're literally looking through more air in our atmosphere uh, as light's coming in toward us. So it's a measure of essentially how much absorption is happening from our own atmosphere. And that's really just determined by the angle at which we observe the star. Um, and that will be important when we sort of look at uh, which uh, source and standard stars we should be comparing to. Uh, this is the integration time. You can see that some objects have very long integrations. This is 120 seconds per image, so about two minutes per image. This is only seven seconds per image, so it's much, you can tell which stars are brighter or fainter based on this. Um, Coads is just a, another way of sort of adding up the, the exposures. And then these last two values here, the slit in the mode, are telling us how the instrument is configured. And this is actually important for our organization because you'll be using, uh, you'll be reducing, uh, those of you who are doing this for the first time, will be reducing the low res 15 mode. This is the prism mode. This is the low resolution mode. And we'll see it's, uh, it's just a very simple short spectrum across the image. Um, and it's uh, the easiest mode that we have to reduce. And there's a lot of these data out there. So that's why we're focusing on it. Um, the slit is essentially when we observe a source, uh, we put the light through a very narrow opening and then there's a dispersive element behind it that spreads it out. And so uh, that slit size basically determines, you know, you know, how small of an opening we use to get the light into our spectrograph. Um, and those of you who were observing last night, uh, sorry, two nights ago, um, you would have seen that we had a camera for looking at the back of the slit so we can see where the source is. And that slit is where we put the light into the spectrograph. So these are just values that tell us uh, something about how the instrument's set up. The important number here is, or important column here for that is this mode, low res 15. If I scroll down, there's actually another mode that comes in, which is short XD. That's the one that the UCSD uh, group is going to be doing, uh, or those who are veterans in this are going to be doing this, is that setting. Um, but that's a different setting and actually produces very different data. And that goes back to low res 15. All right. So there's, and I should say, there's a lot of different spectrums. This is a good data set because there's a lot of sources here. So you can, choose to do the first one or you can choose the last one. It's totally up to you how you want to do it. Um, if I look now in terms of columns, um, you'll see that there's groupings here. So things that have the same source name that are grouped together. Um, there are these files that have uh, things like flat and arc next to them. These are our calibration lamps. We use these to calibrate the detector and the wavelength scale. Um, we'll see that in action just a little bit. Um, and you'll see that these repeat. So we'll have something that looks like a science target, and we know it is because it has a long integration time. Something that is going to be a calibration star to calibrate the absorption from the atmosphere, and that is a bright source. Often we'll have HD in the first two uh, elements of its name. Uh, HD stands for the Henry Draper Catalog. This is a catalog created in the 19th century of bright stars, um, and it persists to this day as sort of a useful reference for some of the brighter stars, uh, particularly the kind of stars that we want to use for calibration. So that will, that will frequently show up there. Uh, and then we have like another set here, which has, again, a set of numbers, a calibration star, and then a sequence of flats and one arc. All right, so this kind of repeats over and over again. Um, the other thing, two things, uh, fine things I'll point out is in the file name, you'll notice that it has kind of a, a prefix. So here it's SPC, down here it's flat, down here it's arc, um, and then a number, a four digit number. That is the file number. And we're gonna be using that when we enter the numbers in for our reduction code. You wanna use this number and it's a little confusing because there's a actual index number here that's one off. So you just wanna make sure you use this number here, not the row number. 
Um, and then the other thing you'll notice that there's this either A or B after the number there. Um, that is, uh, when we take the data, we will take observations in two different positions on the slit. We call those the A and B position. Um, and that's a good way to kind of see that there's a sequence. Um, you'll notice the pattern here. If I go down to this 1231 object, it goes A, B, B, A, A, B, and then it goes to the next source. So we often see these kind of pairs, A, B, B, A, flip back and forth for observations. And that's because we're taking observations in two different positions. We're going to see why that's important in just a little bit. All right. Um, so I think that's most of what we need to know for the log sheets, at least in terms of their content. Does anybody have any questions on, on that? And again, some of this will make more sense when we get to actually looking at the data. Okay, crystal clear so far, all right. Um, so now one thing I like to do, you saw before it was very colorful. One thing I like to do is actually go through to help me organize is to actually color code the information. So I'm actually gonna do, uh, I'm going to do this source here. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually color code the, the column at rows and you can edit these files uh, and you know, annotate them as, as you want. One more column that's important is the notes column. So this allows you to kind of put some information as you're reducing uh, to help you help you explore the things. Um, so one thing I like to do is I like to color code things. So I'll first color code my science target in one color, let's say green the calibrator star that's following it. I'll color that in maybe a red. And then the calibration lamps, the flats and arcs in a third color blue. So this is a kind of unit of data, uh, target calibrator and calibration lamps. Um, and we're gonna see how these uh, operate with each other uh, together. Now, one thing I should say that there's, um, you wanna always check to make sure that your target which again is usually the longer exposure times, has a very similar air mass as your uh, calibrator star. Um, it may not always, um, and there's nothing you can do about it at this point because we can't go back and take the data from 2000, um, but it kind of allows you to organize because sometimes the, some people will observe the standard before the science target, sometimes we'll observe it afterwards. So you'll just wanna just keep an eye on looking at that air mass difference there. Um, and one thing I'll notice that, by the way, this, if I look at this, this is a different integration time than these. And so I think actually this is probably not exposure we want to use because notice it goes A and then it goes A again. We really want A, B, B, A, uh, A again. I think these are probably also, prob oh no, it's an A, B, so we're okay there. Okay, so I've just kind of highlighted these just so I can visually see them very quickly um, as I'm doing the reductions. Questions? Adriana. Yeah, what's the meaning of the blue color? One is the target redness calibration mark, you said, and I... Yeah, so this is the target because it's a long, these are long exposures. Yes. So you, often our science targets are faint objects, so they'll be long exposures. This is a calibrator. It starts with HD and it has a short exposure. And then these files, flats, and arc lamp, these are actually, there are, are lamps inside the instrument, like light bulbs. Okay. Um, and we'll see what those data look like in just a bit, but they basically illuminate the detector from the inside and they provide us with a kind of calibration for the detector. So we always, you know, when we talk about data reduction, what we're really doing is essentially just calibrating our exposure, getting rid of all the sort of uh, biases and systematic effects that change the light from the star into an image. Thank you, Carlos, for the, the, little, the little index there. Yeah. So we'll see where those lamps come in in just a bit, but that's just a part of our uh, analysis part to kind of calibrate what the detector is doing with the light that's coming into the instrument. Juan? And why was it that you uh, unhighlighted the, <clears throat> the first one, like the 0027? Yeah. You so, said that yeah. it was something of that sequence or because of the integrator? Yeah, so, um, and I, I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, and, you know, these are the kind of things that you want to catch. And I would have caught it because if you'll notice, there's a few things that's wrong here. One is it's, it's, this integration time is different from the other ones. And we really want to be comparing data that have the same integration time. 
for the most part. Sometimes an observer will change their mind halfway through and just change the integration time. But often when you see something like this, where it goes from three seconds down to one second, it's probably that this star is so bright that when they did a three second exposure, it saturated the detector. And they said, oh, that's too bright. So I'm going to go down to a shorter exposure time. Um, so that's one flag. The other flag is that, again, the pattern for these files is, except for the, the lamps here, for the you know, observations, it's A, B, B, A. You always observe in pairs. And notice here it was A, A, which means the star was put in the same spot twice in a row. And that it's not going to work because you need to subtract these things. So for those reasons, this is probably not a file that I'm going to need to reduce because it looks like it, the observer was just checking the integration time and said, oh, that's too long. So I'm going to go with a shorter exposure time. And sometimes you see the opposite. They'll do an exposure time and then they'll do a longer exposure time because the first estimate was too short. So you just want to make sure you, you're highlighting these, these pair sequences, A, B, B, A, as the observations. Does that help explain it, Juan? Okay. Yes, yes. makes sense. I Thank see you. Chat. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is just organizing data. Let's actually get into the reductions themselves. So um, I want to let me actually close this up and I'm going to reopen this just to see if that might explain why some of you are having trouble logging in. So again, this is through our guacamole access. And so for those of you who are having trouble getting in, we'll sort of see if we can figure that out. Um, the front page here has the list of all the connections. So those of you who have been using it before, you'll see your name in here. Uh, actually, if you're a UCSD student, you'll see your name in here. For those of you who are visitors, it's this syntax. And I think maybe the contact sheet has something different, but you want to have Ab Lab, and I got to figure out who this is. I think it's if one of you is that, that contact. But for example, uh, Adriana, this is your, your login. And what you would do is you would click on that, and then the screen should come up for a place to put your password. So what I think we're going to do is in my office hours, yeah, maybe it's yours, Carlos. Uh, in your in our office hours, uh, I will see if I can help you uh, if you're having trouble with that aspect of it. Let me demonstrate with mine. So, right, so I'm here, a Bergasser. So if I click on that, um, it does a little bit a pause here, and then if I just wait around a little bit, then this login screen comes up. And this is where you would put your password in. Mine is very long. Okay, and if that works, oops, if, you, if I actually type in my password correctly, sorry. All right, you should see something like, like this screen come up. So if you get to this point, you're good. If you're not getting to this point, why don't we spend some time at one o'clock and uh, help folks get logged in uh, and see if that's something, it could be something that the computer folks need to fix for us. All right, let me just close everything up and start from scratch here. Um, so one of the things uh, when, you, when you're starting up is uh, you wanna sort of organize your data and I'm just gonna get rid of everything so we can do this from the start. Um, I've added a few, and this is in the instructions um, uh, for the, the starting up, but you, you want to add a few uh, folders into your home directory. So my home directory here is indicated by a Bergasser. And um, in particular, what I've added here is this folder called reductions. And in that reductions folder, I've already got another data set here, but I'm going to add a new folder for the data that I'm reducing. And that name is just, again, the sequence of year, month, and day. So you can add a folder by just clicking on create folder here. So I'm going to add a folder called 2003.05.21. And then inside that folder, we're going to add two folders. One is called proc, and one is called cals. Now, to be honest, I'm not sure why this is the convention. It's the convention I've used for like 15 years. Uh, if you want to use a different set of names, that's fine. You just have to make sure uh, you, you keep things consistent. Um, this is where our calibration files are going to go. And this is where our processed spectra files are going to go. 
All right, so that's what the meaning of those two things are. Um, and this is all the organization you need to do to set up for the reductions. Now, I'll also say that the, excuse me, the data themselves are on this computer and they're in the, the top directory. And if I go to, um, I think if I go to, yeah, this place, um, this is the top level directory. This folder is the data folder. And this is where all the specs data are. And you can see the same file convention here, these different years, months, and dates. And so for example, if I go down to the bottom where 2003.05.21 is, you see this huge list of files that have those file names, ARC, flat, go down, this is an alphabetical order. Uh, there's those SPC files. And they have this suffix called FITS. And this is the, a very common uh, image format for astronomical data because it contains the image and the header information. In fact, we have a, a program that we can use to open this. Let me see if this will actually work. I haven't actually tried this. Uh, oh, okay, so let's do, there's a program that we have set up called DS9 and I will uh, provide a little bit more instruction on this in the, the, uh, the help, uh, help document. But if I type DS9, Bash first. Um, this is a fits imager, a fits image uh, uh, program uh, that we use often in astronomy. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up one of these files. So I need to actually go to the right directory. Data stash specs, 2003.05.21. Um, and let me open up just one of these random SPC files, which is our data. And I'll scale that so we can see the entire image. Actually, I know that this is probably small on some of your screens, so I'll try to make this a little bit bigger. I'm just going to change the scale so you can see it a little bit better. So this is a typical prism file. I think this is probably for a bright standard star. What you're seeing here uh, is this bright line is the spectrum of a bright star. It's Wavelength is spread out horizontally across the way, uh, across this image. The short wavelengths are over here, the longer wavelengths over here. And by the way, you know that because over at the very far wavelengths, we're getting to the point where we're at so far into the infrared, we're starting to see the thermal emission from the telescope, from the sky. And so you see all this kind of lots of bright stuff here. Um, and so this is, we'll see this kind of trace quite often um, for these bright stars. Uh, let me just take a look at a one of the data files for the science targets. So we'll do number 24. Let me open up a new one. So I think it's always good to just kind of look at the raw data to so get a feel for it. So this is our science target and we don't really see much in here because the science target is much fainter than the sky background. Let me um, see if I can Shrink that down a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be hard. So this is this source is so faint we actually don't see it um, in this background of uh, these vertical lines, which is actually emission lines from the atmosphere. So um, the molecules in our atmosphere are actually uh, fluorescing light uh, into the infrared, and uh, these vertical bands are the wavelengths of uh, which this this light is being emitted. And it's vertical because this is essentially an image of the slit at that wavelength because it's the whole sky. So it, all the sky goes through the slit and makes a vertical image. So we've got lots of these vertical lines that, that are coming in because the source is so faint compared to the background. And by the way, all this other stuff is kind of snowflakes all over here. These are just bad pixels. Um, and most of this image, you're not going to use any of these data out here because it's not actually illuminated by the spectrograph. But you can see some of those little snowflakes show up inside the region where we have a spectrum. And those will show up as bad pixels. And we'll, we'll have a process that kind of masks those out as we go through. Uh, let me show one more file. Um, I mentioned the calibration lamps. So let's look at one of these arc images. Um, this is a image of the lamp. And I think this is probably argon and thorium. And so again, you see these very sharp pores of vertical lines these are emission lines at specific wavelengths from these lamps. And since we know what wavelengths those lines are coming out, this actually provides us a way of uh, figuring out what the wavelength scale of these data are. So this is one of our calibration frames. 
All right, so this is just a look at the raw data. And again, we'll, we're gonna see more of the images in a little bit later on, but it's kind of good to see this is what actually comes off the instrument. And the goal is to reduce these 2D images with all the other you know, light that's coming in on them at the same time to a 1D spectrum of the star. Any questions at this point and just what the, what the data look like? I think maybe for the, for the, uh, for the UCSD folks, um, let me show you what the SXD data look like and why they're, they're different. So let's take a look at 58. All right, so this is, uh, let's see, Should I change the scale again. All right, so this is the SXD data. Now, instead of having just one band of spectrum, notice that we have multiple kind of bright bands going across. There's some overlap here with some of the old stuff. Um, and you see both a almost horizontal line, not quite, and then lots of vertical lines. And again, this horizontal line is the spectrum of the source. And in this case, the spectrum has actually been dispersed twice in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. It allows us to have kind of a continuous wraparound spectrum that comes back. So this is the long wavelength data. It gets shorter here, and then it picks up again on this side, and it gets shorter in wavelength here, picks up again on this side, turn wavelength here. Um, this is something called cross-dispersed spectroscopy. And what this allows us to do is to get uh, the same wavelength range, but at a higher resolution, more fine separation in the light um, by using kind of two dispersions at the same time. And for practical purposes, this means that we get, you know, data where we have just more resolution to see atomic features, molecular features, et cetera. From a practical perspective, that means you're not just reducing one spectrum, you're actually reducing, uh, you know, three, four, five, maybe six spectra all at once and then stitching them together at the end. So it's a little bit more uh, involved in the reduction process. But in fact, the programs are basically still the same for the, for the reduction. All right, so again, this will be a format of data that uh, if you see it in, so if you're a new reducer and you see this kind of data, you don't need to reduce this data. We wanna go back to the prism mode. Um, but for the UCSD folks, you're gonna get familiar with this particular setting, but it has a very similar, um, similar process. All right, questions on this point? Okay, um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to take a five minute break because we're at the close to the top of the hour, and I want to make sure I'm mindful of folks getting a, a little break here and then. So we're going to take a pause and we're going to start up again at 11 o'clock and go right into the reductions. Um, so uh, let's uh, meet back at uh, 11 o'clock about five more minutes. Uh, we'll see you then. Okay, welcome back everyone. So we're gonna go ahead now and actually start the reduction process. Um, and so this is happening in a code called specs tool. Um, and this is a, a program that operates in a particularly, particular programming language called IDL. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons we're using these computers is that programming language is not a free programming language. You actually have to get a license. It's pretty expensive. So we've installed IDL on these machines. So you can access it there. And the way you access it is you open up a terminal window. And um, if you've set up the computer, if you follow the instructions for setting up uh, your, uh, um, your, your account here, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna CD, which means change directory. This puts me in my home directory. I do PWD here, this list where my home directory is. And I'm gonna go and change directories into this reductions folder and then into this folder for the particular date that I'm working with, 2003.05.21. So if I do a PWD, that tells me what my present working directory is, that's that. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start up the IDL language and it's actually a two-step process. First you type a command called bash, which sets some of the environmental variables that the computer uses. And one of the steps in setting up your account was to copy over a file called .bashrc, if you're interested in programming, you can kind of get into the details for that. But the main idea is that that file contains the sort of 
pointers that tells the computer where to look for things, including the license for this IDL uh, package. So once I do that, I can just type IDL and uh, I get a new prompt here, which says IDL in the front, and it tells me I've successfully logged into IDL. Now, just one word of caution for everyone. Um, we have a limited number of licenses for these. Um, we're trying to get up to the number where we have more than enough for everyone, but because uh, we don't necessarily have that yet, when you're done with reductions, you just wanna make sure to exit out of this IDL uh, package. In fact, you can just close the terminal window. Um, that way it frees up a license for someone else who, who might need it. Um, so we're hopefully we're going to resolve the license issue pretty soon before folks really get into reductions. All right, so this and now we're in this programming environment. What we're just going to do is type the command x specs tool, oops, specs tool, uh, and press return. And this is going to bring up a new window, which is our specs tool reduction window. Um, and a few things to just uh, point out here is that there's a there's a you're navigating through these uh, middle tabs here as we go through the process step. We actually only need three. We need paths, cals, and point source. That's all we're going to work with uh, for this uh, for this data set. Um, the first thing to do is kind of set what paths are for the data, and there's three of them: the raw, the cal, and the proc. So you see that cal and proc there. And so um, you're, you just put in the pathway for the data. And that's when I went in to look at the raw data, that was that slash data slash specs slash 2030521. So it's always going to have this format with just the year that you, the date that you're working with in here at the end. And then the cal path is the folder I just made called cals. And the proc math is a folder I just made with proc. So if you keep the same notation and always CD into this directory, you're, you don't have to change those numbers. Uh, and if I make a mistake, for example, if I accidentally spell this as cal instead of cals, when I switch to the next tab, it's going to say, oh, I can't find that folder. So it will catch any errors that you make. I'm just going to make sure to make it to that. All right. So that's a relatively straightforward step. The next thing is you're going to actually take those flat and arc field uh, files, and the code is going to reduce those into two files that it needs to calibrate the instrument. One is a what's called a pixel response function, uh, which tells us essentially uh, each, you know, each pixel is kind of an independent measurement of light and they respond slightly differently. And so uh, we're gonna take the image that we made with a flat field lamp, which is just a broad spectrum lamp and measure the brightness of each pixel. And assuming that they're supposed to be the same brightness, it kind of figures out how the relative pixels actually vary a little bit. And then the arc lamp was the ones that I showed with the strong vertical lines, and that provides a wavelength calibration for our spectrum. So this is actually a really easy step. If I just go back to my log, and um, I go back down to where my data is highlighted here, here are calibration lamps. So I'm just going to choose the whole sequence here, 34 through 39. And that's how I write this in is I just do 34-39. I just put in the file numbers. And again, because this, you know, this can happen, you want the numbers that are in this file name, not these numbers. You want the file name numbers. So I put those numbers in here. I can just type or click on make calibration frames. And the computer is going to go off and actually do all the work of analyzing them. And Super quick. It's actually already done. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it takes me longer to explain it than the computer to actually do it. Um, what you're seeing in here, this image, which is a little hard to see, is the pixel response. In fact, I'm not sure I can even scale it so that you can see it very well. Um, but this provides, again, the calibration for, um, uh, for each pixel to pixel uh, reference. Uh, I think maybe if I choose the histogram equals, you can see it a little bit better. Maybe not. Uh, any case, there's not much you need to see here. This is just making this uh, sort of calibration file. Now, the great thing is that if you if you want to reduce all of your calibration frames all at once, um, you know we have a few sets here. Here's one flat arc set here. Here's another flat arc set here. So you can actually put in all of those sets all together. So for example, I could put in 48 through 53 was one of them. That's Oops, wrong file there. That's this set, 48 through 53. I could put in this set, 15 through 20. And the next line, 
So I could put up to eight of these calibration sets and then just make them all go. So one of the things I'll often do when I have a new night of reduction is I will just reduce all the calibration frames all at once because uh, it's a nice, easy one-step process. All right, so that's it. So now everything's been pretty straightforward. Well, now we're going to get into a little bit more creative work here. Um, now we're ready to actually extract the spectra from these 2D, 2D images of our, of our sources. Um, and so uh, there's a few things we need to enter in here. First of all, we need to enter in the input prefix. That is this first three letters I have here. And these will differ depending on how the observer actually named their files. So in my case, it's just SPC. So I'll put that in here. And then um, you're going to do this in pairs first, and then you're going to reduce the whole, the whole set sequence of, of each individual source. So I'm going to start with this bright star just because it's a little easier to see what's going on with the bright star first. So I'm going to put in the first pair, 28 and 29. And just again, verifying that it goes A to B, because we're going to need two different positions for the observation. So I'm going to do put 28 to 29 here. Oops, 28 to 29. The flat name is the flat field pile I just made, and it was this middle one, 34 to 38. And the wave cal name, this is the wavelength calibration file, and that was the one I just made, that's 39. Okay, so that's just entering in those data. I'm going to load the image up. Now, what you're going to see is this image, which is actually taking the two images of the, of the star and subtracting them from each other. And so you get a positive uh, line here and a negative line, positive line from the A and the negative line from the B position. And again, the reason we do this is that by subtracting these two images, we get rid of all the other sky background stuff, or at least most of it, because it's going to be present in both images, but the star is in a different position in both images. So it gets rid of the sky background, but preserves the, the source. So and again, you don't have to do anything with it. It just that's what that's what you're seeing in this image, right? And again, the spectrum is kind of going off in the uh, from left to right here. So that's just reading the data. So the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to essentially figure out where on this image the source is. Uh, it's pretty obvious to our eye, but the computer needs to figure out as well. And what it does is it kind of squishes this spectrum uh, horizontally like this and makes what's called a spatial profile. And it's a spatial profile because uh, left to right is the spectral axis. This is the light as a function of wavelength. But top to bottom is where the star is in the slit spatially. So when I click on make spatial profile, what you're going to see is a up and down hump like this, which is basically a representation of these data, but squished in this particular axis. And so you can see that there's clearly a positive peak and a negative peak, which is great because what we can then do is click on this next thing with the this setting to auto and just find the center of these peaks, which is, again, really obvious, but that's because it's a very bright star. Uh, now, the next step is we can skip this one because, uh, for the prism mode because there's just one order. For the SXD data, for those of you UCSD students, you'll have more choices in here, and you'll want to look at the video to see how you decide to not use some of these orders. Um, in this case, I can skip that. I'm just going to go to trace object. And I'm going to leave this unchecked here. And what this is going to do is knowing where the center is, it's now going to trace across the image where the spectrum is going to be extracted. So that's what these horizontal lines are. And then the next step is to define the apertures. And the apertures are where it's actually saying this is where light from the star is versus light from not the star, right, from the background. So I always just start with the default positions and just show apertures. And you'll see two things have appeared here. There's now pairs of green lines here that kind of define where it thinks the source is. And then on this axis, you see a few colored regions. You see green, that's defining where the source is. And you see red, which it uses to define the background. And it needs that because even when we do this subtraction of two images, the sky does change over time. So if there's any residual sky left over, it uses these neighboring regions to uh, sort of measure that and, and correct for it. Now, the goal of this is you want the green to cover as much of the light from the star as possible. And you can see right now, it's not quite 
covering it, right? It kind of stops about a third of the way up. Uh, and this white is kind of the in-between region. So we can expand my aperture to include more of the star by just increasing this number here, PSF app radius. We're gonna change the second number to 1.5. This is in pixels. If I click on show apertures again, notice that this green region has expanded. So I could probably go a little bit further. Maybe we'll do 1.7. And that gets us pretty close to the flat part. So I think that's pretty good. Now this width depends on the scene conditions of that particular night, how much the light is blurred by our atmosphere. So there's not one number that's always gonna be good. And sometimes over the course of the night, that number may change. So you do always wanna kind of do this first step of just taking a look at the apertures and then you know, adjusting that number to encompass as much of the light, but not going too far so you'll get you know, places where there's no, no source light. All right, so now that I'm happy with that, well, all I need to do is then just click on extract, extract spectra and it will do all the hard work of taking a 2D image and making a 1D spectrum, all right? So this is what the 2D spectrum here by measuring the brightness out gives us a 1D measurement of brightness versus wavelength. Um, and there's a lot of features in here that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about over the course of, of the summer. A lot of what you're seeing in these data are actually absorption features from our atmosphere. Like all of this is water from our atmosphere. There's some carbon monoxide from our atmosphere over here. Um, and then there's a few other features that come from the star itself. These very small features are hydrogen absorption lines. As it turns out, this is a bright A star, as we'll see in just a moment. All right, but this is our 1D representation of our 2D spectrum. Any questions on that? So Carlos, a good question. How do we know what's, what's what? Because uh, nothing's labeled here. Part of it will just be experience. Um, you're gonna see these features show up again and again and again. Um, and actually, I think, I wonder if there's a way that we can show. Yeah, actually, so on this tool, uh, this, is a, this is one of the packages that comes with the specs tool to display the spectrum. Um, there's a nice function called plot atmosphere. This is our atmosphere. If I click on that, this yellow line is showing the transmission of light through our atmosphere. And you can see where there's regions where the transmission goes down, which means our atmosphere is absorbing light. There's a corresponding dip in the spectrum of our star. In fact, these line up very well, all right? So that's one of the reasons why I know <laughs> that the features we're seeing are from our atmosphere and not from the star, because it exactly matches the structure of absorption from our atmosphere. Um, some of these are not in the spectrum up here. And so those are features that are intrinsic to the star themselves. And in fact, part of the reason we take these calibration stars is we want to correct for all of the yellow stuff. So we just get to the original spectrum of the star. And we'll see that process in the last step. Okay, any other questions at this point? Okay, so the next step now, that, that was just one pair, right? So we actually have you know three pairs here. If we go back to the logs, we just did these, these two, 28, 29. We still have 30 to 33 to go. And the great things though is um, SPEX tool allows you to do kind of a batch reduction. So if I now, put in the rest of my files for this source, 30 to 33, I can run all of these steps together with this uh, uh, command called do all steps, because all of these will stay set the same way. And if I click that, then I can just kind of sit back for uh, 30 seconds and it's just gonna go through and do all the reduction all, all at once. Very nicely efficient. All right, so we've done all the extraction for our bright star. Now let's turn to the faint star. Uh, and the first pair of files here is 21 through 22. So I'm going to put those in. And again, I always do the first pair manually just so I can set up all the parameters. So I'm going to load image for those things. Same flat and same wavelength cal. Now here's the pairwise subtraction for that. And you'll notice that it's, it, there's a lot more stuff in here. Right? So there's a few vertical lines. These are emission lines in the atmosphere that couldn't be subtracted out because they, they varied between the two exposures. 
you see kind of a, a dark splotch here. This is because the um, background emission, uh, sort of the background thermal emission has changed over the course of the observations. You see some very faint pair of lines, but they're much harder to see. And that's just because this is a much fainter source, right? So this is gonna be typical for a lot of your science targets, these very faint lines with kind of a bunch of noise and other stuff that's, that we still have to get rid of. But the process is still the same. So I'm gonna do uh, make spatial profiles again. And even though this is very faint because you're combining all these data together, it's able to find the two peaks quite well. So I can again, keep this on auto and find stored positions. Now, in some cases, and this happens quite a bit with the SXD data, sometimes the signal isn't enough to give a very clear pair of peaks here, and you kind of have to help the program. And the way you can do that is if you, you can either use guess or fix, but basically you're gonna click and decide where the centers are. And I do this by, so I'm gonna keep guess here, and I'm going to, with my cursor here on the screen, I'm gonna hit the S key on my keyboard for select. And I'm going to go to the peaks and click on the positive and click on the negative. And that gives me kind of a first guess of where the center is. And if I click on the bind store app position again, it basically uses that guess to fine tune where it finds the center. Now, if you see two clear peaks, you just go ahead and use auto, it'll be fine. But if you have much noisier data, then you can, you can actually manually kind of set where these centers are. Now, again, for the case of the faint science targets, here I'm going to uncheck, or sorry, I'm going to check this use app positions instead of trying to fit where the spectrum is. It's just going to assume that the center is going to stay the center, and that, that works pretty well. So it sort of figures out where that is without, without doing much. And then I'm going to do the same show apertures. And in this case, I have it set at 1.7, and it kind of looks, I mean, that's probably okay. It might be a little bit wide. Um, I don't want to include too much of the background here because it's just noise. So I might reduce that down to 1.6 maybe. Just tighten it down a little bit, 1.5. Right. But I think I'm pretty happy with that. So I'll go ahead and extract the spectrum there. And now we've got our spectrum for our source. Notice that it's a lot noisier. In fact, one of the things you can look at is the signal to noise, which is this button here. This is the ratio of how much flux you're measuring divided by the uncertainty. And you can see that you know, that ratio is about 15 at the very peak here, and it gets pretty small. So you know, signal noise of five is, means you've barely detected the signal. It's very, very weak. Um, but that's fine, because we've taken a few exposures, and we're going to build up our signal to noise by combining these together. All right, so then the rest of it is the same as uh, the standard star. I can put in the rest of my files, 23 through 26. All right, and then with everything set the way I liked it for the first pair, I'll just do all steps and it will do all the rest of the extractions all at once. Okay, and that's it, that's the extraction phase. So any questions about, about that? All clear? Uh, yeah, that idea. Yeah. Well, uh, actually I am not into the, 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 this application because I am not in guacamole yet, but, I have a question. Yeah. Be before you said we have two series, we choose a series, series of two lines, two series. And for this last one, we choose four lines. So four lines in the log sheet here. Yeah. 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 So the first time you set up either source, you want to just read in the two exposures because it, it does actually does everything in pairs. So doing the two exposures allows you to, to kind of like look in detail about how it's going to extract out that pair. When we want to, when we've got that all set up, we can reduce all the rest of the files for that source by putting in 
the rest of the files here. I know this is really small on your screen, so you may not be able to see this, but I've put, as you said, four files in here, 23 to 26. Um, it knows when I do do all steps to treat this as two pairs of images. Or if I have you know, eight files here, it knows how to treat it as four pairs of images, right? So the program is smart enough to recognize that you're putting a whole sequence of exposures in here. And so you can, it'll just go pair by pair and reduce them. But when you do the load image, when you go step by step, you wanna do it with just two images. And it will tell you when you've done something wrong. Like if I put in 23 to 26 and I do load image, it will say, I need to have two images and do that. All right. But the do all steps has an extra little software in there to recognize, okay, I've got you know, eight exposures here. So I'm going to do the first two and then the next two and then the next two and then the next two. Um, so that's that's the difference. Okay, okay. This is a kind of a time integration, right? I'm sorry, a tiny... Integration? Uh, so it is 200 seconds is only, you know, that's, uh, what is that? Three minutes, three minutes and a little change. Um, oh. And the reason, it, and that is relatively short. There are some, you know, when we do optical spectroscopy, often we, we might expose on an object for a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Okay. And part of the reason that infrared exposures are shorter is that not only do you see your star, but you're also looking at the sky, which is glowing, right? It's in the infrared, the sky is bright. Um, and so we have to do short exposures because otherwise we would saturate our detector just by the sky. Um, and so that's why you'll often see the infrared um, images, they'll have integration times that might be one second to 300 seconds. Usually that's the largest we have for, for specs. Um, and that's mostly because we're limited by the brightness of the sky. The sky will get too bright and saturate our image. And so it's better to take a lot of little exposures and build up the signal than to take one long exposure. So that is a big difference between infrared and optical spectroscopy. Okay, thank you. It's amazing. So yeah, so happy to hear this. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, thanks. All right, any other questions? Okay, so let's go to the next step. So that was the extraction. That's all you need to do. So I can close all these windows up. And the next part is we've taken, we've extracted a few spectra. So now we're going to combine these spectra, and that program is called XCombSpec, X Combined Spectra. Um, so we bring up a new window here. Uh, we're going to set the path to be our proc folder. And I should say, if I go into this folders, by the way, so I made these a little bit earlier. If I click on our CALs, I've got now a few files in here. These are our calibration frames. If I go into our proc, you'll see all these spectra files. So these are the 1D extractions that I've just done in the extraction phase. So you can always go back in your file system and check that you actually have your files in there. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to combine the individual spectra for you've obtained for each individual source. So if I go back to my logs, I, you know, I have six spectra for the star. I really want one spectra. So I'm going to combine these files together. And so what I do is I just put in the file numbers again, 21 through 26, all six of those, load those in. And you can see you've got this kind of rainbow of spectra here. Uh, and these are colored for each individual source. Um, the first step, and notice that they're kind of scaled differently. Like the red line is a little bit fainter, the or a purplish line is kind of at the top. And that just has to do with the fact that, you know, the star might not have been perfectly in the slit or maybe a cloud came in the view and it, it reduced some of the brightness. But we wanna have, when we combine them, we wanna get sort of a measure of the overall uh, uh, sort of flux. So what we'll do is we'll first scale the spectra. So that's this first button here. And uh, this is actually a pretty straightforward thing. You just want to, you know, get these so they line up. And it actually does it nicely automatically. If you want to improve it, you can choose. So these blue lines tell us the range in which it's, you know, kind of finding the median value. Um, I can narrow this down using my S key and clicking left and right around the brightest part of the spectra. And that has a kind of trivial change to the spectrum, but that, that might help uh, 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 even things out. All right, so that's now all scaled, but there's still like clearly some kind of bad, you know, this, this seems to be a little bit weird of a pixel here. There seems to be some other stuff around here. There's some spectra, a little bit more noise. So the next step we'll do is we'll actually prune the spectra. And this is a little bit of a creative process, but you're going through and trying to find pixels that are deviant 
between the spectra. So it's not so much that the all the spectra go in the same direction in some funny way, but if one or two spectra go off in a funny direction, that's probably because one of those bad pixels or maybe a cosmic ray hit the detector and it's not actual data of our star. So, you know, for example, I'll focus in on this region and you can do this using the zoom feature. That's the Z key on the keyboard and then clicking once on the bottom left corner and once on the upper right corner. Um, this may be a little bit hard to see on your screen, but there is a yellow line and a blue line going straight up here that's different from all the other spectra. So that seems to be that those two exposures had some funny feature that's not related to the spectrum of the star that would throw off our average. So what we could do is we can mask out those data. So I've chosen mask here and I'm going to select my fifth spectrum, which is the yellow one. And again, using my S key, I'm going to select on the left and right side of where this little peak is and it goes away, all right? Uh, now it hasn't been deleted it. I've just said, don't use this part of the spectrum when you combine the data together, all right? It's just saying this is, this is bad data. And there's a blue line here that's doing the same thing. So I'm gonna do the same thing for that one. Right, and that goes away. Um, sometimes the bad pixels are a little bit easier to see if you extend the range. So you can change the vertical range here. If I go say to a Y min of minus five, you'll notice that this green line clearly stands out. So I'm gonna zoom in on that. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna select just the green line and then do S and click and click, and that gets rid of it. Um, I like to think of calling this, we're giving the spectra a bit of a haircut, it's a little, little uh, fuzzy. Um, now, one thing to notice is that the red spectrum here is kind of consistently off, off. And I could go through and I could trim every single one of these, but you know, it looks to me like the blue, red spectrum might just be a bad spectrum. So another thing you can do is you can say, well, the red spectrum is so bad, I'm just gonna remove it. And you can just go to this remove tab, click on two and you've gotten rid of it. Now, I would only do this in the case where one spectrum is clearly very bad. And that again, might be because a cloud came through or it fell out of the slit or something happened during the observation. Um, it's actually better to add, co-add more data than to get rid of you know, half of your data because it looks a little noisy. So this is kind of where like the, you have to make some, some calls about how to combine things. And again, you know, most of the spectra, for example, down here are already noisy. So just picking out one or two features is not really gonna change the overall uh, average of these spectra. So you don't wanna go too far into this. You really just wanna get rid of the most extreme clearly outlined pixels instead of just you know, making this as pretty as possible. Right? The prettiness will come when we average it together. So I'm just gonna keep the second spectrum in for now, even though it's a little bit noisy. And I'm gonna go ahead and accept this, All right? So you can see it's a little bit cleaner. And then um, one step we'll do for the HD stars, we'll do correct spectral state, but we're gonna skip this for this star because it's pretty, pretty faint. Uh, and what we're gonna do is just gonna write this out as a final combined spectrum. So my notation for this is com spec COB C-O-M-B-S-B-E-C, this is just a convention. And then the numbers of the files and combining. So keep an eye on this, it's a very noisy spectrum. When I combine it, you'll notice that it gets much cleaner, right? And again, that's just the process of averaging, right? We're averaging the data together, so we're getting a better measurement of the sort of mean. Still a little bit noisy down here, but much better than the kind of uh, scatter we're seeing down here, all right? And our signal of noise also goes up. If I click on that, you'll notice that now we're up to 40 for the science target as opposed to, to 15 like we were before. Okay. Uh, and sorry, Carlos, I just saw your question. Yes, masking is kind of like we did for the specs uh, spectra. We have masking routines in our splat uh, code as well. But this is just masking to make sure it doesn't fall into the average. So it makes things a little bit cleaner. All right, so the science target is actually the harder one. If I do the calibrator star, which is 28 through 33, because that spectrum is so high signal to noise, this is actually a piece of cake, but it's the same steps. So I'll load in the files for that. I'll click on scale spectra. And again, I can you know, choose a particular range if I want to, to even this out. Um, in this case, there's probably not much in the way of outliers. Let me zoom in in here. 
um, you notice that this is kind of a little bit bumped, but all of the spectra are bumping up there. So this is not bad pixels. This is just the structure of the spectrum, all right? Same thing down here. So none of these are outliers. Um, and that's pretty consistent because these are short exposures. So it's often that you don't have enough time to accumulate things like cosmic rays and bad pixels. So I actually don't have to do anything in here. And then for these bright stars, you can click on this extra step called correct spectral shape. So you notice that they don't perfectly line up all the way across. The, you know, the purple's a little bit brighter over here and a little bit thinner over here. Correct spectral shape kind of uh, tightens up the agreement between these uh, so that they line up on top of each other much better. And then again, we just combine this together using the same notations for 28 through 33. Uh, may have put 29, don't leave 28. Okay, so there's a combined spectrum and it has tremendous signal to noise. It's up to 2000 up here. So that's a really, really good spectrum, All right? But we need it for our calibration. Right, any questions on the combined specs, uh, combined spec stage? I think, Sky, you said this was like the, the, the hardest part for you because you had to figure out what was good pixels or bad pixels. Um, yeah, and yeah. I also have one question. Um, so if we have such a high uh, signal to noise, would it affect um, our final output of graphs? Well, so this spectrum is again of the standard star. So we're gonna see how that gets used later on. You want this to be as high signal noise as possible because you're using it to apply a correction to the science spectrum. So, and, and these stars are really bright. So typically these will have very high signal to noise and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with high signal noise. That's actually a good thing. Um, and in fact, usually we want our calibration stars to be much better signal to noise because we don't want to add noise into our science targets. Um, the whole goal is to reduce our noise to make our signal noise as high as possible. Um, so that's, you know, but, you know, we have the data we have. So there's not, there's not much we can do to kind of change it if we've already collected the data. I don't know if that answered your question, Sky. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And then Carlos had a question, is there any metric to evaluate uh, how good it was done. Um, and, you know, to my metric is when we did the, when I showed the difference between the science, individual science spectra and the combined spectra, if that looks much better than the individual spectra, excuse me, it was good. If you see like some additional kind of large deviance, it may be that you need to clean up a little bit more in that prune stage. So you can go back and forth um, and fix those as you go through. Um, but generally, if the combined spectra has a higher signal to noise in the individual spectra, then, then the combined spectra did what it was supposed to do. Okay. All right, so that's it for that stage. And now we're down to our last stage, which is the Telerk correction, x core This is where we're going to correct for the absorption from our own atmosphere using that bright standard star. So that brings up a new window. And here I'm going to first put in the a uh, file for my standard spectra. I'm just going to click on this, go into my proc folder, and my standard spectra was the bright star that was 28 to 33. And again, this is the combined spectrum. And I'm going to put in my object spectrum, which is 21 to 26. And there's one more piece here that I need to put in, and that's the standard magnitude B and V. So these are the blue and visual magnitudes of my bright standard star. And to find that, if we go back to our log sheet, um, the coordinates for our standard star are here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these two cells and I'm going to open up a new window, which is the Sinbad database. This is a database of astronomical objects. We actually looked at this when we we're doing our stellar astrophysics uh, uh, session last uh, Monday. I'm going to search for the star by coordinates. I just have to get rid of the tab between them here. And um, I get two options, but the first one that's closest is the star that I'm interested in. And it's actually the same name, 101369, uh, HD 101369. So that's the same one. And like we saw before, this page has a lot of information, but most importantly, it contains what the spectral type is. And it's important to verify that this star is an A0V. That particular spectral type is what we use for calibration because we're gonna use a model of what an A0V star is supposed to look like to compare to the observation of what we see 
And the ratio of those tells us, you know, how our atmosphere, how the instrument changed the light from the star surface to where we detected it. And then we're going to use that correction to correct our science vector back to what it's supposed to look like. So we can verify that it's an A0V. And we also get the magnitudes, 6.194 and 6.198. And by the way, I like to often put these values into back into the logs and the notes just so that I have a record. Um, in case I want to go back and re reduce this, I don't have to look up this information again. So that's a good use of our logs. But in any case, I'm going to use those two numbers. I'm going to put them into the two columns here for the B and V magnitudes, and then load up these spectra. Now, again, it uses this value essentially to kind of scale the model in such a way so it matches the star that we're observing as close as possible. That's why it wants that information. Now, I've loaded the spectra, and this kind of green box came up. This is just telling us that the difference in air mass between our object and our standard is, is small, which is good. We want it to be as close to air mass as possible because we want to be correcting for the same line of sight um, in absorption from our atmosphere from the standard as we do for, the, for our science object. Now, the next step is to essentially figure out how the instrument broadens the spectrum. Um, it has a finite resolution. For the SXD mode, you will be using this deconvolution, and there's a description of that in the video. For the PRISM mode, you just select IP because the resolution is so low, it just, we don't actually need to really measure it. We're just going to use the arc lamps to figure it out. So you just select that and say construct kernel. So that's easy. And now we're going to uh, uh, use the observed spectrum and we're going to correct the model so it matches the observed spectrum as much as possible. Now, one reason we use A0 stars is that they have very few features in the infrared because they're very bright stars, about 10,000 degrees Kelvin, very hot in their surfaces. There's no molecules, and so you don't have these molecular absorption features. But there is hydrogen lines, and those hydrogen lines, their, their strengths, their abundances in the atmosphere can vary from star to star. So the model we have for an A0, A0 star may not match the actual source that we observe. So these steps are really to kind of make small adjustments to the model so that we get the perfect fit to what the star actually looks like. So that's what this is. We're going to be scaling the hydrogen lines. So this brings up a new window. And um, what you see here on the bottom is the uh, spectrum of the star, of our A star. Um, it's been uh, calibrated slightly in a different way. And then the yellow line is the telluric absorption. Now, you'll notice that it matches almost perfectly through most of this region. And then it diverges over here. And that's because when we get to the shorter wavelength side, we're starting to see the sensitivity of the instrument decrease. Um, this is an infrared detector, and so it does a much not as good of a job at absorbing light or detecting light at shorter wavelengths. But you still see the features line up pretty well, right? There's a big absorption feature of the atmosphere here, and there's one here for the star. Same thing over here, all right? Uh, what's also labeled are the locations of various hydrogen lines, the transitions, uh, the electronic transitions of electrons bouncing bounce back and forth between the different orbitals around a hydrogen atom will produce specific absorption features in the A star. And those are the lines that we want to fix uh, and adjust so that the model is a good representation of what we've observed. So to do this, we're going to start over here in what's called the K-band region. We're going to zoom in on this one particular line, which is called Bracca gamma, which you probably can't see on the screen there, but we'll zoom in on there. That's probably way too small for you to see, but that's labeled Bracca gamma. Now, a few things to observe. First of all, uh, you do see kind of a little bit of a dip in the light here where the bracket gamma line is. And the goal is we want to make this as flat as possible. If we've adjusted the model so that it exactly reproduces the hydrogen lines, then we should see no residual. We should see just a flat, flat region. And that's the goal is we want to make these as flat as possible. So it's not flat, so that's one thing. The other thing is it's kind of offset a little bit. Right, the main dip here seems to be to the right of where the line is labeled. And this just has to do with the fact that the wavelength calibration for this mode is not perfect. Um, and so we need to kind of shift it around to make sure it lines up with the star itself. And we do this by adjusting this V shift parameter. And um, this, is a, <laughs> this doesn't actually make physical sense. We're changing it by hundreds of kilometers per second. It's not because the star is moving hundreds of kilometers per second. It's just that the wavelength calibration is sufficiently off that we have to make these kind of big adjustments. 
So because the line seems to be too far to the right, I'm going to redshift my model, shift it to the right, so I can make it as flat as possible. So I've made this 100 and notice that this dip moved closer to there and it flattened out a little bit. Um, it's not quite centered, so I'm gonna to go to 200 and maybe 250. And now you can see that it's pretty close to there right in the middle. Um, it might still, again, it's not perfectly flat, it's pretty close. One thing I can do is we can automatically figure out a correction here if I click on the E key and then click to the left and right of this line, it's gonna figure out kind of an automatic scaling to reduce the strength of this line. And what you can see here is it's actually increased this top panel. This is the scale factors. This is essentially adjusting how much the hydrogen line strength should be. And this is done line by line as we go through the model. So by increasing this value, we've kind of flattened this out a little bit more. If I wanna adjust it further, I can grab this with my mouse and pull it up even higher. It makes it a little bit flatter, but Still not quite right, but you know this is pretty close to as flat as I'm going to get it. All right. Um, let's go over here to this region where there's a whole bunch of hydrogen lines. And by the way, these regions where there's lots of lines but a lot of absorption, I tend to avoid because um, you just it, there's so much structure there it's hard to measure them. All right, here you see these green lines are mostly pointed to flat regions. There's a little absorption here, but that matches the yellow lines. So this is actually mostly absorption for our atmosphere, which we're gonna leave in the star, right? This white line we're trying to do is make it as close in shape as the yellow line. But here we see just a little bit of a bump that's in excess of a flat line. There's no corresponding bump in the Tolaric model. So this is absorption features that are not quite correct. So again, I'm gonna do E on either side of these lines and it reduces the scale factor. Now you see it's quite nice and flat. So do the same thing over here and same thing over here. You can see that these scale factors kind of vary in a smooth way. It's a little harder to do these ones because they're overlapping with absorption. But one thing I always found is that you just want to kind of have a smooth correction as you go through here. So I just reduced that just a little bit. Um, these are small adjustments, so you don't have to get it perfect. You just want to get it something that looks, you know, relatively flat through this region as much as possible. This is definitely good enough. Um, and then often I will not do anything about here because these features are so weak that they tend not to actually show up in the spectrum. So I just focus on these two bands. Um, and you can see kind of the pattern here, right? We've kind of scaled up this line. We've scaled down these lines. Um, this is something you'll see pretty often. I'm not sure why it's always offset in this particular way, but almost every uh, correction has to look like this. And again, the whole point is that you're just trying to make this white line look as close to a to lurk with to lurk absorption is as possible. And we're just adjusting the model uh, strength of those hydrogen lines to correct that. Now, this is the most, I would say, creative part of the process. Um, do you have any questions about, about this? And I, I think you're gonna have more questions as you get to actually reducing these things, but this is, I think this is the part that, you know, often takes a little bit of time to kind of get used to. All right, so Carlos says, you know, why, why the heck are we doing this? Why are we matching the white line to the yellow line? Um, this white line is meant to be, uh, in the end, it's going to be essentially the correction we apply to our science target. And that correction should only encompass the absorption from our atmosphere and, you know, any change in the sensitivity of the instrument. So we were fixing those lines in this region because they were producing extra little features that correspond to the standard star itself. But we're not trying to you know, multiply the standard star itself by the science target. We just wanna get an estimate of what the, the atmosphere is doing. So we're adjusting these lines to make sure that the model we use is a good representation of the star so that there's no stellar features, bright star stellar features in this correction spectrum. Does that help explain it a little bit, Carlos? It is a little confusing. Yeah, so in this phase, what we're really doing is just calibrating out the absorption from our atmosphere. And there's also some, some sensitivity for our detector as well. That's what uh, this drop off here, this is the difference between the yellow line and white line here is just because our detector is not as sensitive at these wavelengths. But we're essentially trying to get a 
as good of a correction for the atmospheric absorption as possible. And to do that, we wanna make sure that we're not sort of biasing it by not having a good uh, model for our A0 star. So we're doing these kind of fine adjustments to the model to make sure that that correction doesn't include any features of the standard star itself, any hydrogen features. Okay, you got it, that's great. Cause it's still, it's still a little confusing, I think. You know, and, and this is kind of a subtle process, but the main goal is that we just wanna make, we're, the whole goal is we wanna correct the star spectrum that we observe on the ground to what it looks like at the star surface because that's where the physics come in, comes in. Um, and so we're doing these kind of fine scale things to, to make sure that our correction model is as accurate as possible. All right, any other questions? So this, I'd say this is the hardest part to, to kind of make sense of. So if you're still a little bit confused, that's totally fine. Um, you'll get some practice on it as we go through. Okay. All right. So once I'm kind of happy with that, and again, you're going to likely see this same kind of pattern, you know, a shift in sort of the hundreds of kilometers per second, this kind of scale factor variation, you're just going to accept it and then construct the Tilleric spectrum. So that is that correction spectrum that it's going to do. Now there's one last little fix we got to make. And uh, when we observe a standard star and then a science target in two different directions at two different times, sometimes the instrument will shift a little bit. And so those spectra won't necessarily line up perfectly. So we're gonna make sure we get that wavelength alignment as good as possible. And that's this wavelength shift. So we'll just click on GIF shift and we get a new window here. And here's what you're seeing. On the bottom is our science target, right? Still a little bit noisy. Uh, and this has actually been corrected for the telluric absorption. Um, and actually, I think it's lined up pretty well, but we're gonna see how that might vary. If these correction factors are slightly off shifted, you'll actually see some uh, sort of extra features that are not real, but it's just because that uh, the, sh the wavelength shift is a little bit off. So we're gonna try to figure out what is the optimal shift between those in wavelength space by choosing a particularly sharp feature. And I like to use this one in the K band. You see it's kind of up and down. This is due to water absorption in our atmosphere, but it produces kind of a nice sharp feature that if they're offset, you're gonna see big residuals if they're not perfectly aligned. So again, I'm gonna use the S key and select around this feature. And then I'm gonna click on this auto find. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna like march through a bunch of different shifts until it finds the one that's most closely aligned. So just keep an eye on what happens down here as it goes through here. I'm not sure how well the zoom will capture the animation, um, but it starts off with some extra residuals, it flattens out, and then you get more residuals when it goes too far. And then it just kind of finds the optimal value. So it didn't change very much because I think we were lined up pretty well before, but sometimes this can actually really help uh, make the toilet correction as, as good as possible. And that's it. We don't have to do much more beyond that. So we'll just accept that and you're done. So now we have to do is just save the file off. Our naming convention is specs-prism. If you're doing the SXD mode, you do specs-SXD. And then the name of the source, which was uh, 1132, let's go back here, 1132 minus 1446, and then underscore, and then the date, 2003-05-21. And then I like to save everything else, the Tolerc and the model, and if I write file, here is our finally totally reduced, fully calibrated science spectra. Still a little noisy because it's a faint source, but this now has everything corrected for it. Um, and this is the spectrum that we can actually do some science on. All right. Um, and again, you can look and see what the signal to noise looks like. It's pretty good. Um, you can look at the uncertainty, you can look at the flux, there's a bunch of things you can look at this, but this is kind of a, this is kind of our final, uh, final data set, All right? Uh, and that's it. So you've now reduced, uh, we've now reduced one spectrum and, you know, now we can move on to the next one. And at the end of the day, you know, the end of reducing a, a nights of data, we'll have a few codes that kind of, kind of read in all of these reduced spectra and kind of visualize them so we can get sort of an assessment of the quality of them. But this is the, the full process, at least getting to the point of reducing a prism spectrum. All right. Any, any questions? I know this was a lot and some of you who are having trouble 
getting logged into Guacamole, it's hard to follow because you're not able to, to match it. So let's hopefully, let's see if we can get that fixed. Um, but any other questions based on what you saw either here or in the, the video? Ah, Bridget, excellent question. Um, what do we show at the end of Friday? Um, one thing I would say, so there's a couple things you can do. Um, you know, this, your simplest thing, let me share my screen again. Um, the simplest thing is you've got your final spectrum here. So I can just take a screen copy on my computer. So I've uh, clicked on open Apple shift four uh, and just clicked on it. And now I've got a, a picture of my spectrum. Um, I think there is a way, let's see if there's a way to plot this. Sorry, there's like a little bit of funkiness there. Let's see if I can plot this in a way. Uh, yeah. No, it looks like I can't actually save it off as a, a plot file. Um, the other thing is if we look into our proc folder here, uh, you'll see that you now have three more files. Specs prism, that's the thing you just named. Then there's one that's the Vega model. And then there's one that's the Telerik absorption model. Um, this is your science uh, file. So one thing you can do is you can download this file um, and I'll try to give some instructions on how you can do that uh, for your machine. Um, but you can download this file and then you can run it into, you can run it through Splat uh, and you can read it in uh, Splat and then make a plot of it using the Splat tools as well. Uh, Splat will definitely recognize this file um, if you use the convention splat.spectrum file equals the name of that, um, it will be able to read it in and then you can, you can plot it using the Splat tools as well. So, you know, there's an easy way to do it. And then there's a way that you can kind of get used to the Splat tools a little bit. Um, you know, and you can also bring up a, a browser window in here and um, uh, mail it to yourself if you want to do that. That's another way you can do it. Uh, there's kind of different ways of, of organizing the data this way. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's, you know, Bridget, what you want to do is kind of like, you know, at the baseline, either at least show us a picture that you got from your final reduction, or I would encourage you to try to see if you can get that out of the Guacamole computer and plotting it using the Splat tools. And that will give you, you know, that way you can plot like where the features are, you can compare it to the classic, you know, the classification standards. So there's a couple of different ways that you can get a little bit more information from that. Okay, any other questions? Now, one thing, by the way, when you're done, don't forget, exit so that other folks can use IDL uh, when you're done. And then I usually tend to just also close the, close the terminal window just to make sure it's cleared out. Um, Rocco, question. So in addition to reducing uh, like a data set and kind of presenting our specs at the next meeting, for those of us who have the projects, are we starting on the projects yet or are we just doing reductions for this time being? So this week we're focusing on reductions and that will go through a little bit into next week. And then next week is when we're gonna to start to organize for the science projects. Okay, so it's just straight up reductions for this full week? Yep. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Other questions? All right, so for those of you who are doing the SXD data, you're probably familiar with the prism mode. So this is kind of uh, probably a review. Um, we don't have time today to do the SXD part, but it's exactly the same uh, tools. There's one more tool at the end called X merge orders. Uh, oh, I know what I can show. Uh, sorry, there's one more tool that we can look at. And that's um, if you have an asteroid spectrum, uh, this is not gonna be exactly right because we're not looking at asteroid data, but I will do it anyways. Um, so what we've been doing for that tel X tel core is to essentially correct for the absorption of our atmosphere to get a picture of what the spectrum, the emergent spectrum of the source is. For asteroid observations, in those cases, what we're often doing is just trying to measure the reflectance of the surface of the asteroid. And of course, the asteroids are illuminated by a G2 star. Uh, that is the same spectrotype as our sun. And so for that part, all we're really doing is dividing out the spectrum of a G2 star to get to the uh, sort of ratio of light that's reflected by the asteroid. So it's a little bit different of a science measurement. Instead of trying to get the emergent spectrum of a star, we're measuring the reflectance of the surface of the asteroid. That's of course related to its composition. 
And that uses a slightly different code called XTelcore basic. And for our purposes, this is gonna be a little bit different because we're not, we're not doing an asteroid right now. Um, but I will, I will just show you this. Actually, I'm in the wrong folder, so let me exit out of here. So let me go into our reductions, 2003 um, And then let me actually, I think I actually have this in the other folder. Two thousand one oh one two nine. Okay, so let me bring up the log sheets for that particular run. I think that one contains asteroids. Yep, actually, that's Michaela. That's your data set. Okay, so let me bring up IDL for that just so I can demonstrate the asteroid one. So this is XTEL core basic. So at this point, we've already done the extraction and the combination XCOM spec. And now we're bringing up a slightly different version of XTEL core, a simpler version, um, because we're not going to create a model for the uh, calibrator star. We're just doing a straight division out. Uh, it's much more simple. Um, and so I think for this case, we are looking at five. Uh, let's see, sorry, that's, that was 2000, oh, 1029. Okay, so uh, in this data set, I think we were reducing this object, which is an asteroid. Notice it has lots of files. And then this is a G2 V star. Oops. Right there. Things are a little slow. Um, so in this case, I made yellow, or maybe Michaela made yellow the normal uh, science target. Red is our calibrator star. So we're going to use this as a model for a G2 star because we're really modeling the sun, because um, the sun is what's you know, illuminating our asteroids. So for this particular set, we're going to put in the standard spectra is that combination, which was 2041, and the object spectrum, and load those up. And then this is actually super easy because we don't have to do any of the, you know, uh, figuring out the the absorption profile. We don't have to fix the hydrogen lines because all we're doing is just dividing out. So the only thing we have to just make sure is that the alignment of these two spectra are right. So if I click on this get shifts, we're doing this a little bit more out of order. But the same kind of idea, I'm gonna just select this region here. And it's a little hard to see because the scale's kind of all over the place, but let's see if I can zoom this down and you can see a little bit better what the spectrum looks like. All right, so already it's kind of flat there. I'm doing exactly the same process of finding a sharp feature. I mean, auto find, and it's going to go through and try to make sure that this lines up as flat as possible. Okay. And then we are not restoring the continuum. We're just dividing our spectrum by G2. So we just say no, and that's it. <laughs> that's the entire process. So if I just put in the, uh, I'm just gonna put an attempt for this because I don't wanna save it totally yet. Um, this is what the reflectance spectrum of this particular asteroid looks like. All right, so this is a slightly different step for these asteroids because we're not actually interested in their emergence spectra because they are not hot enough to produce light that we can see in the infrared. What we're, all we're looking at is just how, what fraction of light is, is bounced back at us from the sun as a function of wavelength. And this is pretty typical. This is an ice feature on the surface of the asteroid. Um, otherwise, it's not particularly, uh, not a lot of structures out here, but um, and if you look at the video, there's a little bit of a place where you can kind of confirm that this is something that looks like an asteroid reflectance spectrum. But that's the only difference for prism mode reduction. And that, yes, Rocco, that is in place of the X telcore. This is X telcore uh, underscore basic. Right, so let's see. Yeah, X telcore basic. So it's different code, but it's, uh, it's kind of the same, uh, same suite of family. Okay, well, we're at noon. So um, I think I'm gonna pause it here. Uh, again, any questions that folks have at this point? 
I agree. <laughs> I think asteroid spectra are actually easier to reduce, but we won't tell the, uh, the asteroid people that. Um, okay, so Eduardo asks, on Friday, we will present only one reduction or we present as many as we can. So uh, Eduardo, I would say just choose one. I mean, if you're able to reduce like several spectra, that's fantastic, but just choose one that you either really like or you think is interesting or maybe you think is kind of weird. Um, just choose one, just we, we have a big team. So if we each show, you know, 50 spectra, that would be a very long Friday. So just choose one and you're gonna add it, uh, add the image to our uh, Friday slide presentation, which I'll make sure to make available a little bit earlier this week. Okay, other questions? Well, as I said, only doing it, we will have questions. At the, at the moment, I can reach that platform, but let's see, <laughs> let's see what happens. Okay, so let me, let me, um, let me stop the recording now. Um,